everybody. So the big word going around has been exosomes and I finally get a chance to sit down with Phil and talk about exosomes. So I am so excited that you get to have a few minutes of your time with me and tell me about exosomes. And so let's start by just tell me what exosomes are. Mm, okay, yeah. Yeah, so exosomes is kind of the buzzword at the moment. Yeah, we've seen it not just with us, but it's been talked about all over. Um, recently, when we went to the A4M conference, there was, you know, much, much talk about exosomes. Everyone was really interested. So, yeah, it's time to really understand what they are. And it, let me ask you something real quick. So are mm -hmm. they the next frontier in cell therapy, you think? Well, I don't know if they're the next frontier. Uh -huh. um, I mean, as you know, I've been involved in cell therapy for many years now yes. and uh, we often see we always say you know stem cells is the future and soon we'll be able to grow organs and cure this and cure that with stem cells um i think that process is going to be a lot slower than we actually thought yeah mm -hmm. if i think about you know 10 15 years ago we said the same things that we're saying now mm -hmm. so i think the, the development with stem cells is is a, a longer journey that we have in front of us but, and you can't really influence them very much, let's right. say that way, yeah. But the thing you can work with is exosomes, mm -hmm. yeah. So exosomes are really the signals that stem cells send out. So they, the stem cells have to communicate with one another and they have to communicate with other cells. And they do this through exosomes. These are the signals, yeah. So for example, when we treat someone with stem cells, let's say we do stromovascular fraction, SVF, we give them an IV. <coughs> We know these stem cells kind of, they move around, they go into the lungs, they go into the liver and the kidneys, and a lot of them just get stuck there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, we give a sugar and other things to help kind of push them through, but many just get stuck. But we want that to happen because when they get stuck, they release lots of signals. And these signals trigger the release of your stem cells from the bone marrow, from the fat. So if we give you a few million stem cells, suddenly they activate millions and millions of stem cells that are in your body. Yeah? And they do that through these signals, which are called exosomes. So exosomes are actually not a stem cell. No, themselves. they're not a stem cell. Right. Cell. So when you look at them under the microscope, they're a tiny little dot. That's all you see. Yeah. And what it actually is, is if, if you imagine the, the stem cell is, is wrapped in kind of like a, an, an oil film, yeah, it's the outside of, of, of a cell. Yeah? And basically what it is, is part of that film forms like a bubble and informa in, inflammation. information from inside of the stem cell goes inside of that bubble and it breaks off of the stem cell. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a little piece of encapsulated information and that floats over to the next stem cell or to the next cell, hits that cell and becomes a part of the cell. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like a neurotransmitter, which is just a chemical that there's a signal. This is actual kind of a bundle of information that goes from one cell mm -hmm. and it's ingested by the next cell. And that, mm -hmm. that's what an exosome is. Mm -hmm. um, I know you're dying to ask a question. Well, I, yeah, well, I was, I was going to ask how, the, how they work, how they but work. you're actually, you know, yeah. going into it as we speak. Okay, so if yeah. you want to tell me about how, the, how they work a little bit more, yeah, that would sure. be great. Yeah, I can tell you about that. Well, let me, let me just tell you a little bit of the history, you know, why we talk about exosomes and things like that. For example, some experiments that have been done, you can have, we know with our, our stem cells, once we get older, they actually don't send out as many exosomes as when some when the stem cells are young. Right. So we can see the stems we can see the exosomes under the microscope, we can see these particles, we can count these particles. So we know if we take stem cells from an older person and stimulate them, they produce exosomes. We take stem cells from a young person and stimulate them, they produce exosomes. But the young person's exosome, um, stem cells mm -hmm. produce many, many more exosomes. Yeah. So we can see that this signaling kind of gets less and less as we get older. And it can also be impacted by our health. So we have health problems or chronically ill. Again, the exosome signals coming from the stem cells are less. Yeah, I have to say too that exosomes are not only unique to stem cells. Uh -huh. Yeah, exosomes is a signaling form that we find viruses can signal through exosomes, or bacteria can signal through exosomes, other cells can signal through exosomes. So this is a signaling pathway that, mm -hmm. that all kind of living things have with inside of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, some interesting things that we saw. For example, if you take the stem cells of an older person and you take stem cells of a young person and put them together in the same media, they're not touching, maybe put like a screen in between, the stem cells of the old person start to get young again, even though those cells are not touching. Yeah, And that's because these young cells are communicating with the old cells through exosomes. So signals are going out from these younger cells, going to the older cells, 
and giving the older cells the information that they need to rejuvenate. It was quite fascinating. It is, yeah. and this is not the same <coughs> as the, there's a therapy that I've heard of called uh, young blood therapy. This is, yes. is it the same? No. It's not the same, um, but it, it works on the same principle. Um, so the young blood therapy, this actually developed, this is also a lab experiment where they actually attached two animals together. So mm -hmm. it was actually two rats, I think, were attached, a young one and an old one. And they attached the, the circulatory system. So the blood was passing between the two, yeah. And the old rat started to rejuvenate and become younger because of the blood of the young rat that was going on. So this is the young blood therapy. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a therapy form done in many countries where you'll get the blood from you know, young people or even children uh, are, are transfused into older people and it kind of rejuvenates them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way that works is not because the blood has some magic power or some magic rejuvenating power. It's the exosomes that are being released from the blood are giving the signals to the old cells of what they need to do to rejuvenate and become mm -hmm. young again. Yeah? And remember, it's information that's coming out of a cell and being put into another cell. So it's not just, they're not just being told what to do. There's actual you know, RNA that's being transferred there. And that's why these older cells can rejuvenate. Yeah? So this is how the young blood therapy works. It's basically all the signals that come out of that young blood then affect, affect the, um, the, the cells in the, in the human. Yeah? Yeah. So we see exosomes are really, really powerful. Is, is this like um, a new therapy? Like how, how long has exosomes been around? Exosomes have actually been around for a long time. So, okay, now it's a buzzword kind of and everyone's talking about it, but exosomes have been around for quite some time. Really? Even at Infusio, we were using exosomes maybe three years ago. Yeah. We stopped because nobody knew what exosomes were. I would talk about exosomes. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. And we were, we were looking at ways to program them and all kinds of things like that because you can influence them. Um, but the bottom line was no one really understood what they were and, and there wasn't much literature out there so we just kind of left that for, for the time being. But now there's more research and just more literature and it's just more well known, let's say. Okay. Yeah? Right. The original research with exosomes um, was basically looking at them to, to transport medication because they can go into a cell, they can, you, they can be trained to target certain areas or like if you have cancer you can train them to target cancer. So that you can kind of piggyback a, a medication on that and know it's going to get to a destination. And this is basically where all the research has been uh, in the use of exosomes. So they're, they're very well researched as far as their, their safety is concerned. Right. Yeah? So right. many trials are in the second phase or even the third phase using exosomes. But to get to that phase, first of all, you have to check the safety. Yeah, that's right. the phase one trials that are done. Right. And there's many, many that have been done. It, so, the, so what this is telling me is that mm. there are um, actually studies out there yes. on yeah. exosomes and uh, that prove them safe. That prove them safe, right. yeah. But now you've got them safe, now you've got to say, what can we do with them? Yes. Yeah? And of course, in our world, pharma is, is king. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and using them as a delivery system for drugs is the way to go. And that's where the money is. And that's why this is where the main body of research has been, simply. Yeah. But what we do know about exosomes, they control the cellular environment. Basically, they tell a cell, this is how you ought to be. Mm -hmm. yeah? So if a cell is sick, if a cell is suffering, if a cell is damaged, the exosome can go there and say, look, this is what you need to do to fix yourself. And it gives it a little bit of information, information it gives it a little bit of RNA and kind of other things that it needs to be able to rejuvenate itself. Yeah? So this isn't kind of some magic that old cells just turn young there right. is actually something being implanted into the cell so it's able to do that right. through the exosome and and so um who who is who can benefit from exosomes well that's that's kind of the question yeah. <laughs> who can benefit so we don't have a mass of studies saying you know exosomes could be used for this and used for this and used for this but what we know about exosomes tells us a lot about how we can use them for example when we analyze exosomes, break them down and look at their chemical composition, we can see that there are many, many anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines that are with these exosomes. So of course it's logical to think you could use exosomes to treat inflammation. Mm -hmm, yeah? mm -hmm. And we can't call them studies, but let's say clinical investigations where they've been used. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Through translational medicine you say, okay, we know they're anti-inflammatory, let me use them on inflammation and see what happens. Yeah? Right. It's not a study at that point, but you can use it. And you're seeing that the, the reports coming back are showing that they have an immediate anti-inflammatory response or a trigger an immediate anti-inflammatory response in the body, which is great if you have an inflammatory disease like arthritis or things like that. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. can see it works very, very well. 
and also where immune modulation is needed. We're seeing that they work well there. So patients with autoimmune disease, so you could maybe use exosomes to, mm, it's not the magic bullet, right. but it's going to modulate their immune system and help break down that autoimmunity. Yeah. Right. We've uh, also seen it in the cosmetic area, just simply microneedling exosomes into the skin. So you need to create a little bit of inflammation and then the exosomes get in there and tell the cells, this is how you ought to mm. be. Suddenly you look young again, yeah, because it rejuvenates the skin. Right. Or for hair growth, we've seen too, you know, can inject them into the scalp and, and the hair will rejuvenate <laughs> basically right, yeah. and grow better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are, these are areas where exosomes are, are currently being used. So we have, Let's call them reports yes. yeah, of thousands and thousands of patients yeah, where we see doctors are using exosomes and they're reporting about how they're working. So there, there are not masses of studies to say, okay, exosomes is a treatment for this disease. Right. We don't have that yet. Right. But through translational medicine, we're starting to utilize exosomes for the treatment of disease. Right, right. Yeah. But I mean, there I say that because so many um, illnesses <coughs> Uh, include the the inflammatory process mm -hmm. so what that tells me is that using exosomes can help many you know mm -hmm. many diseases right yes yeah and that's what we think too and so uh, we want to uh, in the future actually run trials we want to start clinical trials um, to use exosomes so we can actually it's almost like developing a drug that we can really say we these form of exosomes can do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we have a treatment protocol. So of course that's a long process, you know, really to get from the, the beginning to the end, we're looking at maybe eight years until we can really get to that final stage. You know, if stage three studies of using right, exosomes. But right. this is the this is the route that we're gonna take because we really want to prove that these really work well for specific things. Right. Yeah. Of course at the moment for us Lyme is very, very interesting, um, just because we have so many Lyme patients. Right. Um, I think too we have to say there, exosomes aren't the cure for Lyme. So the same way as stem cells, stem cells don't treat Lyme, they right. treat the general situation within the body, yeah. same things with exosomes. Right. Yeah. I think for Lyme patients, the exosomes are very beneficial, mm -hmm. just simply because mm, several things. First of all, uh, we know that these stem cells that we give, the work they actually do is triggered by the exosomes that they release. Mm -hmm. So if we're taking our own stem cells, and then we're putting them back in, you're going to get a good exosome response from that. But if I take exosomes from a young person, or take, yeah, and give those to you, mm -hmm. I think the response is going to be much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is what we're doing. The exosomes that we have, we don't, we could take them from someone. We can take your blood and we can spin out exosomes or we, we can take um, stem cells and stimulate them and make exosomes from your own stem cells. This is all something we can do. But also we can take mesenchymal stem cells that we get from placenta, mm -hmm. so in the lab, yeah. These are, these are lab cells, so when we talk about that, you shouldn't imagine us having like a placenta hanging there and we're right. squeezing out. Th thank it's you, not that, yeah. thank you for, yeah, thank <laughs> it's you not for, that at all, yeah, yeah, for talking about that. So these are laboratory cells that you can buy, yeah, so we, you can order them and use them in the laboratory. So if you order them from the laboratory, first of all, you know they're GMP, so good manufacturing process, they they're safe, they've been mm. screened, there's no disease in them, they're nothing. This is a cell line that is absolutely safe, completely analyzed to use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we know they're placental cells, so they, they're at someone who's at year zero. So these are the, the youngest, most potent, most active cells yeah, yeah, you can totally. think. So you think as an infant, those stem cells are all there to make you grow and develop, and yeah, they want to fix things and get things going. Mm -hmm. So we take those stem cells, stimulate them, collect their exosomes. <coughs> First of all, Let's say the ratio of the amount of exosomes being produced is much higher because these are young cells. Yeah? So we can take those exosomes and give them to our patients. And I think that could be very, very beneficial, especially for Lyme patients. Mm -hmm. First of all, because the DNA is maybe a little bit damaged, there's lots of genetic things going on, they've been sick for a very long time, been in an inflammatory state for a long yeah. time. So let's take, let's take some outside information and put it in there um, to tell the stem cells what to do. Also, we know that um, a lot of Lyme patients have problems with inflammation. Yes. Yeah, and some of them react to stem cells in an inflammatory way, yeah. Um, so if we can avoid giving any pro-inflammatory cytokines by just using exosomes, which we can completely analyze before we give them, so we know exactly what we're giving, I think that might also be a safer, um, just maybe more beneficial for some patients, especially Lyme patients where they have a lot of inflammatory issues. 
Yeah. Right, right. Because the thing with stromovascular diffraction, it works well. We've seen it, it very it works well. We can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it, it's kind of you get what you get. Yes. Yeah? We yeah. harvest it, that's what you get. Yeah? And we see the difference. Some patients get a lot, some patients don't get yeah. so much. Yeah? yeah. And we don't really know what's in it. I mean, theoretically, you could send it into the lab and get it all analyzed. But by the time we've done that, it's dead. So mm -hmm. you can't give it back. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. So this is where exosomes are something that we can quantify and see exactly what we've got right. and we can give it to the patient. Right, yeah, yeah. it sounds so exciting. <coughs> it, it sounds like, you know, it's something that can help a lot, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ask you, of all of, this is a lot of information, yeah. um, but <coughs> of all that you know about the exosomes, what is like the, the, uh, the, you know, the future of exosomes that mm. excites you more, you know, what is it about them that gets you going? Because uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty big buzzword right now. Sure, yeah. What I really like about exosomes is that you have a certain amount of control over them. Yeah. Yeah. You can actually train them to do things. You can expose them to certain things that's going to cause them to do a certain action. Yeah. Or it can go into the, to the point where you can actually gene manipulate before you produce them. Um, so let's say I want to fix diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can in the lab have mesenchymal stem cells that I already alter to make them go more into pancreas cells, mm -hmm. and then stimulate them to get those exosomes, and those exosomes are going to go into the pancreas. Yeah. So th these are things that you can actually control. Whereas stem cells are very—they're kind of like children. You know, you right. give them, you can tell them what to do or try, but they kind of do what they want to do, and that's about it. Yeah. Right. Uh, with exosomes, we can train them better. Yeah. So I think this. This has, in my opinion, maybe, um, yeah, I think we will have more modalities y using exosomes a in a shorter years time. From now. Yes, yeah. rather than uh, looking at the stem cells. Yeah. So I think that's, that's very, very exciting. Yeah, it totally is, yeah. And um, another thing that I, I know that you mentioned this before, but I want to also mention again is that it's not a magic bullet. <coughs> It's definitely no. not, a, not a magic bullet. You know, we don't want people to out there to think that they're going to get exosomes and then, you know, everything is going to be fine and dandy and, right, and you yeah. know, so. And we have to say they're not a treatment for Lyme. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. same as stem cells. Many people think, oh, I took my stem cells for my Lyme disease. No, yeah, it's not a treatment for that. It's just simply a, a systemic rejuvenation that we right. can do through those. Right, yeah, yeah they <coughs> sound very, very promising. Yeah, and as I said, they're not new. Um, we used them about three years ago. I was busy making exosomes from blood. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, I tried them on myself. You did? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why well, am I not surprised? <laughs> yeah. I actually have pictures of me in the lab making them and I have pictures of my exosomes. Yeah. I think I posted them out recently on, on Ask Infusio. Um, <clears throat> it was a very interesting experience. I mean, I took them. I felt great for a couple of days. Uh -huh. And then I really crashed afterwards oh. and thought, oh my goodness, what is this? Yeah. yeah. Um, and because we didn't know so much about them back then, I was a bit concerned. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can make exosomes in different ways. This, this way I made them, I had to kind of put something into the blood to make them kind of precipitate out of the blood. Yes. So I was worried that this feeling bad afterwards had something to do with contamination maybe. You know, and I tried it a few times. And, do, and every time I did it, I just felt... I felt great and mm -hmm. then I felt awful for a few mm -hmm. days, yeah. Mm -hmm. We tried it on a few patients, same thing. They felt great and then they felt awful, yeah. yeah. But because we couldn't explain it, we kind of backed off and left it for a little while. But we saw the potential, yeah. And there were other doctors also. A doctor here, mm, very close here, was also making exosomes. And uh, he was also using them on patients and seeing the same thing. Yeah. Feel great, feel yeah. awful, feel okay afterwards, yeah, kind yeah, of that, yeah. 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 Then we started experimenting with influencing them. So, for example, um, we can put like electromagnetic frequencies on them to, to stimulate them to do something, or you can expose them to different particles to stimulate. So we started experimenting with that, and it was really exciting um, to see the results that we got from that. Right. But again, it was too early. It was just simply yeah, too early. There yeah, wasn't yeah. the body of research behind it really right. to back up what we were doing. But now things have changed, and that's totally. why I think this is a this, this is, is a good the way. time. This, this is, is the, the time. time. Absolutely, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you know, I think that um, <coughs> you were talking about like you know crashing and feeling great mm. and crashing, and I think that with this type of uh, approach, 
the the healing process is not necessarily linear you know what exactly, I mean? It, yes. It's just, uh, you do have good days and then you have bad days and then you have good days and more good days and it's just, you know, a matter of, of um, time and, and patience. Most and, definitely. And patience and taking care of yourself yeah. and all of that. But I know you have to go because you have well, yeah. all sorts of things mm -hmm. to do. If there, is there anything else that you want to share with us about the exosomes? Otherwise, on to your yeah. next uh, adventure. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there's still, yeah, there's things I can share. For example, um, where I think exosomes are beneficial to is I think they will speed up the process. Yes. Because when we give stem cells, we're kind of reliant on them to produce the exosomes to get the whole thing going. But we've skipped a step if we already give the exosomes. Mm. So I, I think that will really help um, speed things up as far as the process is concerned. Also, there's some interesting things. I know um, many of our patients, or there's a, a whole group of our patients that have got to the stage now where they're, they're in more of an inflammatory state. Yeah. yeah so. We, MCAS is the buzzword, another buzzword yes, too, another the mast buzzword, cells have been, right. been stimulating mm -hmm. things. And we found some very interesting things there. Uh, maybe I'll just share that with you too, because this yes. is an opportunity yes. to do that. Please do. Um, so what we've seen with many patients, and this we've, we've got other studies now that we've looked at, so more information has come up. Um, the way Lyme works, so when you get infected with Lyme or when you get infected with anything really, you have a certain immune response that we can measure. Yeah, so we talk about the immune globulins. Mm -hmm. So often when things get into the blood, the first thing that we see is what we call an immune globulin M will go up. So when we monitor that, we can see, okay, M has gone up. And then typically when, when a disease progresses, after a couple of weeks, we see the immune globulin G go up. And immune globulin G is really there to protect your tissue. Yeah, so immune globulin M is in the blood. That's the first response. Mm -hmm. And once things start to go into the tissue, then the immune globulin G comes on and it kind of kills off the bugs that are in the tissue. So when you see the labs of an infection, the M goes up, then the G goes up mm. afterwards, yeah. So someone gets Lyme disease, immune globulin M goes up, so that's the typical first test that you do, yeah. And typically a doctor will give antibiotics at that point, yeah, right. Lyme disease. And then we see the immune globulin M go back down, yeah. And the immune globulin G doesn't go up, so the doctor says, okay, that was a successful treatment. <coughs> yeah. But, interesting. About a year, year and a half ago, um, Dr. Nicole Baumgart, uh, she brought out a paper that showed that Lyme actually hijacks your immune system in a way that it goes into the lymph nodes and prevents the production of immune globulin G, which is kind of intelligent if you think about it, because Lyme wants to survive in your tissue. It doesn't yes. want to be floating around in your blood, it wants yeah, to go in the tissue. Totally. So it, it prevents Yeah, so it prevents that immune reaction happening in the tissue. Yeah. So that means when you look at the doctor's point of view, he's giving you antibiotics, the IgM went down, the IgG didn't go up, so he thinks it's successful, but no, the Lyme's moved into the tissue and stopped the immune globulin G being produced. Mm. Yeah? So now we can live there nice and safe and does well. Now without the immune globulin G, everything else can move into the tissue as well. So we see Epstein-Barr virus, CMV, all these things kind of going into the tissue and being in there. Yeah. Now what we found, and this is almost all of our patients, and we were wondering about this, and we've, we've monitored this for many years. We've seen that after cell therapy, everybody's immune globulin G suddenly shoots up. We see it goes in a few waves. It goes up to about 600, then it goes up to about 800, and then some patients reach about 1,000, and it tends to stop there. Mm. Yeah? And we were wondering why that happens. But what we see now with the studies from Dr. Baumgart is just simply we're re-establishing the body's ability to produce immune globulin G, yeah? So unfortunately, some patients have seen this as a, react, uh, a reactivation of their Lyme because right. they didn't have immune globulin G and now all of a sudden they're at 600. But actually, immune globulin G isn't a marker for acute infection. It's not a reinfection of Lyme or a reactivation. Mm -hmm. It's just simply now we've activated that whole system where the tissue can now rid itself of the pathogens that are in there, yeah? And interestingly, we see for Lyme, the IgG go up, for Epstein-Barr will go up, any other viruses around it will all of a sudden shoot up. Yeah? It goes in waves because we know the immune globulin G is only active for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. yeah? And once that's used up, another boost is given. Yeah? And once that's used up, another boost is given. And that's why we see this kind of go up to 600, and then to 800, and then to 1,000. Yeah? Mm. It takes a few years for IgG to go back down. So once it's done its job, it's just kind of dormant and there. So when you right. do a test, it's there, but it's actually not doing anything. And it takes, takes years for that to go down. Right. You know? But anyway, that was really, really interesting for us because we saw we are re kind of reestablishing a system that's been broken by right. Lyme. And this is what we're doing through the use of, of stem cells or stromovascular fraction. Right. 
Right. Now that comes with a price, unfortunately. Well, the good side of it, oh, let me start again. So we've, we've been reviewing many patients now who've said, you know, I've been through the, the treatment program they and, don't feel and I'm, better. Not, I'm feeling even worse yeah. maybe and, and my mast cells and now I'm allergic to everything. So we've been reviewing these patients, yeah. Very interesting to see is the majority that we send for Elispot mm -hmm. and other, you know, Lyme tests are right. actually coming back negative, negative. Yeah, or very, very low, yeah. And we talked to Dr. Armin about this as well because we sent everything to Armin Labs because we want it to be a standardized test that we look at. And he's saying the same thing, yes. that these patients are down, yeah? Right. Most definitely. But it doesn't mean they're feeling better because their Lyme's gone or, or not detectable, but they're mm -hmm. feeling worse, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. This is where the mast cell issue comes in. Yes. Yeah. So mast cells is, uh, is also been a buzzword in the totally. medical community. I mean, we went to the, the Lyme conference in Chicago. We've been to the A4M recently. Everybody's talking about this inflammatory syndrome that patients are having, yeah? yeah. So it doesn't just seem to be in the Lyme world. It's not an infusio problem. It's really, it's a, a growing, almost like a pandemic yeah, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, people have yeah, that. Yeah. So there's even the scientists. Scientists are always different to the doctors. The doctors are seeing the patients. The scientists are developing things, yeah. So the scientists were saying that they think that many Lyme patients actually don't have Lyme. Mm -hmm. Although there is no such thing as chronic Lyme, which we, we've heard before, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the underlying disease is mast cell activation, yeah. They say they can't divine the d define the disease. So mast cell activation is what they call the inappropriate action of the mast cells, basically meaning once they get sparked, they just get out of control. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's probably the simplest way to put it. And they're suggesting that many Lyme patients already had an underlying mast cell problem. And you could identify that because in the childhood they had allergies, simple things like hay fever or asthma, or when they do sport, they get asthma, things like that, yeah. with typical things yeah, that they had. Now. One of the major triggers, and this is where I said um, stimulating the IgG or getting that to work again comes with a price, because one of the major triggers of mast cells uh -huh. is immune globulin G. Yeah. So now let's think about it. If you had an underlying mast cell issue uh -huh. before, then you get Lyme disease, yes. yeah? your allergies go away. Because yes. now all of a sudden all those triggers are going away. So we always think of histamine, histamine, but actually yes. IgG is one of the major triggers of mast cells. So you get Lyme, all those kind of allergic things go away but then you have a whole different set of problems with the Lyme. Yes. Now we've got rid of the Lyme, the IgG's come back, now we're triggering those mast cells again. Yeah. yeah? We've made it a little worse because we know through neurohealing the number of mast cells multiplies by about 10 times. So now you've got 10 times of those misfunctioning, malfunctioning mast cells yeah. than you had before being bathed in immune globulin G so that mm. activates them. Mm. Yeah. When you activate a, uh, a mast cell it doesn't just release histamine. Everyone's kind of fixed on the histamine, but it releases literally hundreds of signals, different signals, yeah? And interesting is that each mast cell releases its own combination of signals. It's not like an identical thing. And so one mast cell can actually trigger another, and then that can trigger another. So once this system gets triggered, it just snowballs out of control, mm. and there's no getting behind it. It doesn't matter what you do, everything aggravates it, yeah? And this is what we're seeing with the patients. So they go through the program, Kind of their, their Lyme issues go down and things like that, but now they're in this inflammatory state, right. yeah, MCAS, yeah, and feeling right. a lot worse than they were before. And this is where we see exosomes as come being into place. come into play. Yes, yes. yes. Because with the exosomes, <coughs> we can break that inflammatory cycle. Because this is what we've been trying. So we give histamine scavenger, and patients that react to histamine do very, very well. But yeah. there's a lot, it's not just the histamine, there's other things. So yeah. they're you know, taking histamine scavenger, they're taking steroids and still suffering, yeah? And mm -hmm. it's just because of these multiple triggers for the mast cells. And, right. and it's really difficult to find out which one's what and what's happening. Right. So when we, give, um, when we give exosomes, basically we tell the mast cells, look guys, you know, just calm down for a bit, yeah? So that you have all the anti-inflammatory properties from the exosomes, but they have the signals that are actually going into the mast cells, getting them to normalize. So you can break that cycle. It doesn't mean that all the, the reactions magically disappear because we still have the problem of mold, the patients react to mold yeah. and things like that. But this now allows you to pinpoint those factors and deal with those, mm. yeah, rather than just have this all kind of like smoke that you can't see through. Yeah, yeah? no, and you know, and it really, it, it seems <coughs> to me, the way I see it, it's like a big puzzle, right? It you is, know, and, yes. and it's kind of like putting mm -hmm. all the pieces of, of pieces of the puzzle together. Yes, you know, exosomes uh -huh. being one of 
mm -hmm. the, the key pieces. Right, yeah. And so this is where I see them really having value. So once you've got to that inflammatory state, that's where we can go, go in and, and do things. And I mean, it's, we're happy that we've seen Lyme go down. You know, patients come to us for their Lyme treatment and we have a positive test beforehand and negative test afterwards. Unfortunately, our patients don't feel better just because yeah. their Lyme's gone, yeah? yeah? So we've got to kind of see this as a, as a whole and then kind of work our way through the layers. And I think this is a key application for exosomes is just to break that inflammatory cycle, get the cells to just calm down and shut up for a little bit, let's <laughs> say, yeah? And then that smoke goes away. You can actually see where the fires are. So maybe it is mold that we need to look at. Maybe there are some parasites. Maybe there are some retroviruses or something, yeah? But that allows us to pinpoint things yeah rather than just kind of blindly shoot around. And, yeah, it's and like honing it. in. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So this is what I'm excited about. Yeah, yes. and we, we've tried it on a few. Um, we've had some, some patients that really were not doing well. Yeah? yeah, really were not doing well. So we called them in and said, look, we're just going to try this. See how you feel. Yeah. And it's worked really, really well. Awesome. Yeah. That's good. And I was That's excited about that. I tried it on myself too, because yeah. as you know, I have problems with inflammation, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it was the same thing, yeah. I did exosomes, I felt great for a day, yeah. I suddenly looked, you know, 20 pounds lighter, because all the inflammation went away, and yeah. you know, I was walking around holding my pants, because they wanted to fall down. <laughs> yeah. Felt great for a day, then I had three days where I was like, what did I do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it kind of all went back the other way again. Right. Uh, but then that calmed down. Um, now I'm about six weeks out, yeah. and I must say I feel really good, good compared to beforehand. Yeah, and I'm seeing that with others too that we've done. Yeah, that yeah. So again, I'm not saying this is the magic bullet or we've discovered the cure for, but it's just a logical conclusion of how exosomes work, and this is an application where we see they work quite well. Awesome. Yeah. So we want to spend time collecting data um, so that we can really prove that yes, this is what they do in this way. And I'm sure down the road we'll have, you know, a drug yeah, <laughs> that we can actually use totally. for that. So Great. these are the exciting things that are going on with it. So I want to tell you that as great. well. Great. No, I'm so. Oh my gosh. Up. Yeah, that's yeah. great. I'm so glad that you that you brought that up because it is it's really important because you know we we see it out there. We see some people that are not feeling well. So now sure. everything sort of like starts to make more sense. You know. Yes. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. No, great. Well, thanks that we could talk for a little bit. Yeah, me too. I'm really glad we did. Go get back to my stuff. Do that. Yes, all right. Thanks I'll talk everyone. to you soon. Talk to you too. Okay.